Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Roman winemaking. You get about four years. Almost ready. Ah yes, the Roman days where we all wear togas and drink delicious wine and you know, get close with each other for days on end. Well, I hate to break it to you, but this wine sucked. It was dangerous to consume. Being a winemaker, this ancient sommelier, you would consume about 12 grams of lead per day, just tasting your creation, right? It's horrible. Winemakers would harvest the grapes, they would press the fat with their feet, the best part, right? It's what we all wanna do. And then in order to wash out that size 14 Roman foot taste, makers would lace the wine with lead to, you know, sweeten it up. Remember what we did to Coca-Cola back in the day? That wasn't nearly as bad as a bottle of red lead redemption back in the ancient Roman times. Yeah, I'm gonna never complain about table wine at a wedding ever again. Red or white, I'm like, thank you. I don't care if it's really warm, thank you. Number nine, leech collectors. Dude, if you didn't grow up fishing, this next one's gonna make your skin crawl. Leeches, just watch Stand By Me, you'll get it. These blood suckers have been collected for years, like centuries years, and still used to this day. Used as an ancient medicinal aid, leeches would let your blood. Bloodletting. Basically just suck out all the infection, disease, germ, nastiness, right out of you and all out of that wound. They basically eat the infection and speed up the process. A leech collector did exactly that. They jumped into bogs and marshes and just kinda let them attach themselves to, well, themselves. Then bottle them up and sell them. Tons of health benefits too. Some negatives, of course. First off, the leech collectors could bleed a lot. Obviously, right? Back and forth, in and out of the river for hours. Sometimes these guys would even pass out or die. No band-aids, unfortunately. No added danger pay, too. I didn't expect that one. Number eight, armpit plucker. My unibrow, this right here, this is a new hobby of mine. I'm plucking this bad boy every other day and I'm thrilled about it. Armpit hair, on the other hand, I would shriek, okay? I only have like seven armpit hairs, so I gotta preserve them, right? But in ancient times, they gots to go. Working out was often done naked, right? Ancient Greek naked exercise in the scorching sun, ah, nothing better. So naturally an armpit or two is gonna stink. So the solution here to stay, you know, sane while you're training was for everybody to just pluck their armpit hairs out, okay? No more unpleasant odors, that's it. But the point here, imagine doing that job. Somebody had to do, doink, someone had to do all of them. I mean, plucking hairs now, that's satisfying at least and a little bit you know, easier. You could laser half your sh But a warrior's armpit? No thank you, the Old Spice guy would have quit his job. Number seven, barber surgeons. If you like candy like me, you've made a regular visit to the dentist. Little numbing here, a little numbing there, a little flavored mold and floss. Yeah, not always as comfortable. Actually, a trip to the dentist chair was extremely scary and dangerous. Good news is they also cut your hair. A barber surgeon was a very popular and respected job throughout the Roman times all the way to about the 18th century. These people were skilled at anything surgical. Remove a tooth, get all the bugs and lice out of your hair, eh, I'll do it in one sitting. Not the cleanest job though. Lice, blood, infected teeth just hanging around all day, the smell alone, ugh. You know everyone had tonsil stones back then too. Worms living in their teeth? They had an extensive understanding of the human body. Well, as best they could. These people were also in charge of dyeing hair as well. Pigeon poop, urine, dung. These people tried it all for that Farrah Fawcett blonde blowout. Okay, so a little one on the sides, two on top, and then we're just gonna yank those teeth right out of ya. All right, should be about 15 minutes. Number six. Toad doctor. If you don't want to go through the lengths of becoming a medical doctor and doing anything, you know, just go the toad route. It's a little bit easier. Be very specific about where you're doing your activities. There you go. That way your competition is next to none, right? There you go. Back in the day, it was the 1600s, mind you, but medical researchers believed that toads had inside of them healing properties. That's me spreading out of a, a toad, so you can see that. So they were often dried up and powdered and then applied directly to your skin to soothe inflammation. Awesome. I don't know what's worse in this situation, the guy getting the toad's guts rubbed on his orbital or the doctor who has to dry up said toad. Both are pretty bad. Number five. Gardeners. If you've ever done some fun gardening on a nice Sunday afternoon, you'll know that your back hurts, there's bees everywhere, and it's hot under that sun. Gardening is hard work. Imagine being a gardener in Rome or Middle Ages. Like no tools, no water source, no sun safety, and the king's private fruits here and queen's favorite red anthuriums there. Gardens up walls, secret private hidden gardens underground. That's a long day. Also, that's a lot of walking pails of water to these things. Yeah, no hoses. Like to walk to the river and grab a bucket and come back. A lot. 
These people must have had shoulders and lats like a great white shark, dude. Just squatting double pails for 16 hours a day? You know those people were jacked. Also, they didn't have weed whackers, so when you look at these beautiful painted castles and gardens, just know someone was getting screamed at with a rusty pair of shears. Yeah. Also, no lawnmowers. Like how? The whole field? Okay. Number four, Arming Squire. Being a knight obviously sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, the lady, they're saving the, you know, the damsel in the tower with the dragon and the breath. We get it, we've seen Shrek. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, okay? But that's just what being a knight is, right? It's glorious, right? Well, first of all, this process starts when you're seven years old. Then you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. Now, finally, at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but a royal job nonetheless. And also, you don't have a choice, so have fun. Arming squires, see, these lads had the responsibility of repairing a knight's armor while the knight was still wearing it. Yeah, up close and personal. Yeah, which buckle broke was it? Awesome, awesome. How was the battle? You guys did really well out there. Yeah, repairing chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal. Welcome to the Dark Ages, I guess. After these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor, inside and out. Yeah, this was long before Dawn soap was a thing. So they had to clean said armor with urine. Yeah. Hey, let's wash this piss out with a bucket of piss. That ought to do it. Number three, alchemists. Alchemy in history has gone through a couple of transitions. Basically, at first, an alchemist dealt with everything. Literally. From ancient China, India, and Greece, these people mixed what they could find and see. You know what I mean? See what happens if we mix some dirt and some olive oil. You know, write it down. They were scientists. It's the foundation of chemistry alone. They did experiments. Heavily spiritual, philosophical, and medicinal. Medieval alchemists produced hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sodium carbonate. They were good. One eye of newt here, a little stomach acid here, and whoa, 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 whoa! Also so heavily associated with witchcraft and wizardry over the years. Potions, elixirs, the alchemist's purpose was to advance and help with the quality of life. Lots of explosions though. Yeah, very dangerous. Mercury, carbon monoxide, yeah, dangerous stuff. They were playing around with things that were really bad for us. For the purpose of making us better. Very selfless job, you know? Number two, rower. I can't even raise my hand in class longer than six minutes. I have to start holding it, then I switch, and then I just bail on the question, and then I live my life not knowing what hydrogen is, all right? I couldn't imagine being a rower, okay? Heading back to the times of ancient Greece, where wars were fought through naval battle, left-handed, right-handed, guess what, it didn't matter. Your arms were shaking every single day, all day long. When we think of these rowers, this job obviously sucked. It was one of the worst to have, and more often than not, it was sadly slaves who had the misfortune of propelling these warlords into their battle. The payment was also non-existent, really. Just a meal for the day, if that. Asking for a break or not keeping up to the rower next to you would ultimately lead to your death. And the number one spot, the gong farmer. The stink of all stinks. These men were employed to go around and basically scoop and clean out bathroom houses. Plumber waste disposal hybrid. You get where I'm going with this. They were the people who dug out and removed human excrement from privies and cesspits. They were the OG waste collectors, but by hand. Yeah, and scoops and buckets and stuff. No gloves, no PPE, just hand loading them into trolleys, buckets sloshing all over the place in the middle of the night. Obviously being disgusting, gong farmers were only allowed to work at night, hence the nightmen. These guys would have to hop down into these pits at night, waist deep, swimming around, and just taking turns on who's loading and who's scooping. They were paid well though. Yeah, usually double or triple the regular. Toxic gases, infections, drowning. This job was dangerous. And definitely the grossest. Just sitting on your lunch break, you know what I mean? Ah, ham and cheese, yum. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to 
depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator, and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor, as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord, and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case-by-case -case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically, and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits, and so they would be given a large ladle, and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been, and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare, so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. 
Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of, and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages, and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number three, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale, and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business, but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale life was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole. Or in these poor souls cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a gravedigger busy for days. However, I thank the gravediggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. 
Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from Red Dead Redemption and well, the, the ones from Hamlet. Those guys are pretty weird, actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number eight, saloon owner. Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to 1, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kind of want to be a barkeep now. Number seven, lady of the evening. I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hardworking men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Oof. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings. That kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but you get shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon-wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home, Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kind of guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business, where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me, at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number five, gambler. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed to want it big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft, that means another spin, baby. Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes, it's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, what if we employ someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, con men. You'll like this one, guys. You're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made for the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, 
And as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and improved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved Vigor Supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, a photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild, wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the Old West, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String being in around to look for you, that's all I can say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy, who would've thought? Number 10, working in general. I know. World War I, 1914 to 1918. If you didn't guess already, this wasn't the age of women, or at least treating them right. Just wasn't. This, however, was the beginning of things changing. The war had a lot to do with that. When men went off to war, women had to fill their shoes in places of work. When, in reality, a few years prior to that, a woman working was a ridiculous idea. But what's a gal gonna do when she's got no choice? Knuckle up, buckle down, and do it, do it, do it. It might seem silly today to even mention women going to work, but this is good history. In the beginning of women's suffrage, really the middle of it. Number nine, this one's really cool, I like this one, this one's crazy. The Radium Girls. Yes, the Radium Girls, this is just a crazy story. So, this material called radium was discovered and its glowing properties were quickly put to work for military application. You'll find a lot of times that military service often boosts technology development. Just how it goes. So when a factory that was producing glow-in-the-dark watches for the war effort needed workers, they looked to women to stand up to the challenge. Day in, day out, these women painted with radium paint. The women were advised to keep the brushes with a fine tip by placing it between their lips. Kind of just a little lick, a little, a little kiss kind of, kind of cute. Some women even used it on their nails and others painted on each other. The novelty of glow-in-the-dark paint quickly wore off, however, when it proved to be very harmful to one's health, especially since the women had been ingesting the harmful paint. In the end, it was radiation sickness. One woman had it so bad her jaw simply fell off. That's not it, I saw the picture, bro. It's, it's, it's just gone. It's, uh, uh. Number eight, the Canary Girls. A very similar story to the previous, but perhaps one you may be unfamiliar with. The Canary Girls sing a familiar tune to that of the Radium Girls, except it wasn't radioactive, but rather just TNT. How could TNT be harmful besides when it blows up, right? That's what I thought. The only trouble I've seen with TNT is when Wile E. Coyote accidentally blows himself up trying to get the Roadrunner. That's where I get all my scientific knowledge from. I'm a scientist, what can you say? Well, besides cartoon antics, TNT was quite harmful due to the chemicals that made it up. So harmful, it would make the women sick. It would turn their skin orange and hair yellow, like a big bird yellow. Yeah, that yellow. It even sadly affected children born whose mothers had been exposed to the chemicals. Canary babies, as they were so called. This is why we have work safety rules. And ladies, next time there's a global conflict, check what's in the factory first before they throw you in there. You don't want to catch any of that, that's bad for you. 
Number 7. Ambulance Driver Chauffeurs and drivers were a man's job when cars began to take over the roads. You gotta imagine this is a time when cars are still really new. However, why use a man there when we could use him in the trenches? Many women were trained and drove ambulances from the battlefield staging area back to a safer safer area where doctors and nurses await your arrival. The pay wasn't great, there was lots of screaming, and a slight chance of getting shelled by German artillery. There's a part of me that always gets nervous while watching footage of this time period. Like the cars just look kind of flimsy, right? And they look like they could fall apart at any minute. In driving through the mud and the blood, top speeds only are going to be around 20 to 30 miles per hour tops. Cars get like 40 horsepower at most, which in case you didn't know is very slow. Usain Bolt on his best day runs twice that speed. I don't know about you, I, I hope you, you ever see that footage and the cars are so like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't look like they're gonna make it up the hill, it's weird. Number six, nurse. I know, I know. Yes, lots of ladies were, are, and going to be nurses. That's nothing new. And any nurse out there in the medical profession, thank you for your service. Chetty thanks you. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in the medical profession how busy a hospital floor can be on a bad night. Nurses running around, paging doctors, phones ringing, papers flying, something about a code blue. Hectic, right? Well, imagine that, but less equipment. A hundred years less technology, and all whilst under the suppression and threat of bombardment. Great. Yeah, not so fun, right? Sure, any nurse has comfy sketchers to take her to the graveyard shift, but no nurse has blast-proof equipment to treat people in a graveyard, as this is a field hospital, and this is the best they can do for the time being. Yeah, see that's not fun. That's kind of unusual. This is, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Number five, ladies of the trench. This makes sense. A lot of sense, really. And as weird and crazy as it might sound, it might have made the men feel a little bit better. Trench life was awful. Refer to my World War I videos here. They're pretty good, I promise. Mud, blood, rats, disease, sickness, machine guns, barbed wire, no man's land, chemical warfare, and sadly, when all that was done and gone, brutal, borderline, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. That just must be terrible. I played Battlefield 1, that's fun, but in real life, that's just not fun. So when soldiers were taken out of rotation for a little R&R, &R, they might be pleased to see a brothel on wheels. That's right. Or when visiting certain northern towns in France, a very legal brothel uh, houses, if you will. When Americans joined the fight, of 1,000 men being treated in hospital, 190 were being treated for a brothel related sickness. Go get them, boys. Some men would even ask for ladies who were known to possess such qualities because they knew if they caught it, it meant 30 days in a bed and not in a trench. That's honestly such a big brain play, I can't even. Number four, widow. Might not be an official occupation, but it is an official title, and officially, it sucks. Imagine a world where it's difficult to get by, a world where a woman is a second class citizen. So when her husband, her brother, her father, and maybe even her son get drafted to fight Germany and don't make it back, well, it's, it's not fun. Some struggled to find work, others remarried, and some had no choice but to practice the time old tradition of the world's oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Tough times, man. Especially for the ladies, not cool. Number three, farmers. Gotta tend to those fields, partner. This is also a time where there is farm equipment, yes, but not as common as today. It would have been expensive and nowhere near the state of the art farm equipment that we have today. Milking machines, combines, tractors, you name it. In 1914, it's offspring. That's your farm equipment. That's how it works. Ever notice how farmhouses got lots of bedrooms? Well, if you can't afford to hire farmhands, then you make some. Except, however, the key issue with the last point as well as here is the men in your family getting sent to war. Not coming back for four years is a problem. Or in a worst case scenario, not coming back at all. I mean, I'm sure some came back, they just came back in boxes. Which means wives, women, sisters, and daughters had to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And I don't have to tell any farmer watching this how important their job is, or how difficult it can be. You gotta feed the folks after all. Gotta do what's right by me, Dutch. <laughs> I don't know how farming's western, but all right. Number two, dancer. Little bit of a stretch here, but hear me out. World War I ended in 1918. By 1920, the Allies' economies had picked up, but especially in America. This was a time of great success, as a wise man once said. The Roaring Twenties, while the war was over, many folks were still feeling the effects, especially in Europe. Germany wasn't doing too hot, and they're gonna come back for a sequel. It's not gonna be good. As the sale of alcohol was banned, underground clubs began to open. Speakeasies, you may have heard them from my 20s videos. Men, soldiers returning home, women, and minorities of all backgrounds were hanging out in these places, which was very progressive and cool for the time. 
The ladies were becoming flappers, which were dancers, out of the factories and enjoying the luxuries of a healthy economy. And I'm sure some of it had to start in 1918 at least because they knew the end was coming. It had to. It just had to. Trust me, it makes sense. Number one, politicians. For the first time in a long time, women were becoming politicians. Not presidents or governors, but their voices were being heard in the political space regardless, which is huge. A one Miss Rankin was voted into the US House of Representatives in 1916. A woman's right advocate, all brought to you by women's suffrage. I don't have to tell you how unusual that really is for the time. Especially for the time. Unfortunately for these ladies, while there would be some great step forwards like earning the right to vote and social progress in the 1920s, things would go back a few steps during the 40s and the 50s and wouldn't see massive resurgence until the late 60s and 70s. You gotta remember the good stuff though, even if it's baby steps. Number 10, soldier. Yes, that's right. There were female soldiers during the war. Not as many as Call of Duty Vanguard would like you to believe there was, but there was. There was. This was the 1940s. Women were still fighting for equality, in particular the resistance groups of Europe that were fighting the oppression of German occupation, most famously being the French resistance during the German occupation of France. Women like Nicole Manet were active ground soldiers, just not in a professional army, usually operating in the shadows and with sabotage. However, every once in a while head-on-head -head combat was engaged. It's not a professional army, but they're, they're soldiers. It counts. I checked. I called the chief. He said it counts. Number nine, spy. The name's Bond. James Bond. Except, no, it's, it's not, because we're talking about lady spies. That's right. If you asked your grandmother what she did during World War II, she might say, I worked in a factory. I was a baker, a farmer, and a nurse. Somebody worked in a military office or something like that. What you might be surprised to hear, however, is that grandma was a spy. Yes, that's right. Espionage. I think a lot of people think about the CIA, MI6, or KGB when they think about spies, and you'd be right, as that was the golden age of spy versus spy. However, everything has its start, and it all started in World War II. The OSS, for example, is stated to have over 13,000 members. One of every nine was a woman. Makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You never know who to trust really. Could be a dude, could be a woman, could be mom, could be dad, you just don't know. Could be grandma, you never know. Number eight, pilot. This is partly to do with the logistics issue of war, but again, without women in the fight, it would not have gone so smoothly. Basically, the idea boils down to, we need every available man in the war effort. Soldiers, pilots, technicians, sailors, officers, engineers, drivers. Just about anyone who was able to, and even some of those who weren't, were thrown into the mix. That's what it's like for men. That means we got some, uh, that means we have to get some iron-willed ladies who aren't afraid to roll up their sleeves, and that means a lot of women, because women are not afraid to roll up their sleeves. That's how, that's how it goes. To get the job done. This included female pilots. Not in combat, but arguably just as important. Actually, no, not arguable. It is just as important. Delivery, hear me out. The US and Britain were pumping out war machines the same way I pumped Doritos into my boiler on a Saturday night. However, if you walked into a warehouse full of complete airplanes after coming out of the factory, how do you get them to the desired area? Right, the answer is getting brave women to make countless flights in order to get the planes where they needed to be. I think a lot of people just don't think about that stuff. When you make the stuff, you gotta get it from point A to point B. And we have a lot of women to thank for that. Number seven, Rivet Rosie. I did mention this in my World War I video, but this is where the magic really happened. Rivet Rosie, editor, put a picture up of Rivet Rosie right back there or something. Put a picture, or maybe in front of me, I don't know. Rivet Rosie. Some theory holds water here. We needed the ladies to roll up their sleeves and start welding, stamping, and producing war materials for the war effort. World War II was the most destructive war in human history, but something that I think just doesn't get talked about enough is the massive logistics issue that went on. Millions of resources being manufactured and shipped all over the world from the US just to put a stop to the mustache man and his two henchmen. Not one tank, gun, bullet, or bootstrap would be possible without the efforts of women in factories. And that's just the truth. Number six, mother. Hey, listen, being a mom is tough. It's a process, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. But sadly, a lot of moms got knocks on the doors in the 1940s when they didn't want to. Got a folded American flag and condolences from Uncle Sam. Given the number of men that lost their lives during the conflict, it's a knock on the door that happened all too often. However, on the other side of the pond, it was a similar story, except in places like Berlin, there was no door, or maybe even a house, because it was bombed to smithereens. Imagine trying to raise a kid in a place like that. 
and your town looks like something from Fallout. Yeah, it's not easy. So shout out to all the moms out there that lived through it one day at a time and made it through. Number five, Sniper. Ludmila Pavelchenko was a Russian sharpshooter during World War II. This is a woman who was in active combat and is credited with over 300 KIAs. That's a lot of dudes. See, this is a lady we need a movie or a game about Hollywood. While in quality of the 1940s was very much existent in the Soviet Union during World War II, her, her bravery and service is to be commemorated. But if you know history, and you know how well the Russian invasion went for Germany, and especially in the first few months, the Soviet Union applied a strategy I like to call anything goes. Meaning, until they received supplies and aid from their newly found allies to the east, Russia, being Russia, was going to throw anything at the Germans to stop them. That included female soldiers on the ground. She was one of a few Russian sharpshooters that proved to be very effective in combat and as a tool of propaganda for the state. It just makes sense. Number 4, Nagasaki. This one is a broad stroke, but basically anyone who was in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, finger quote, working on those special days, that counts as an unusual job. Maybe you've worked construction, or you worked some really hot sunny days. It's rough, maybe you worked in an office where the gears of bureaucracy and red tape hold you back from doing your best. Headache maker, am I right? Imagine you're working your job and literally 10 seconds later, you hear the largest bomb ever to fall on a city all of a sudden. And it's gone, like the city's just gone. It was there a second ago, but now it's gone. I don't wanna get into too much horrific detail in case the YouTube gods are listening and they might smite me, but Google Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You'll see what I mean. Number three, pinup girl. Models, actresses, and anyone who had hips that don't lie had their images printed, painted, and posted everywhere for informal display. That's right, informal. Intentions on this one are completely dishonorable. But at the same time, might have helped, I don't know. Where would we be if Betty Grable wasn't showing some ankle on every B-52 bomber that was Berlin bound? See, exactly, I know. Ask Grandpa, he'll tell you. While these glamorous ladies may not have been directly involved in the war effort, it was their job to remind those boys just what they were fighting for. I salute you, sailors. Number two, code breakers. This was a time before computers and the internet. So if a German code came across your desk, you couldn't just ask Google, what in the heck does that mean? We owe a lot to the code breakers. Shout out to Alan Turing. He, he's pretty smart. But it's the women in all the military offices everywhere in every allied nation working every day to make the enemy's information get revealed. It's actually very important that happens, trust me. Which in the long run saved lives. A lot of lives. I'll be honest too. Some of the stuff they had to help decipher wasn't easy. I struggle enough with Call of Duty zombie Easter eggs. Yeah, don't don't call me for that. I, I'll, t I'll carry you to high rounds, but I can't get you. I can't solve the Easter egg, man. I'll carry you, but it's not gonna happen. Number one, everyone else. This one goes out to every woman who, in some way or another, participated in the world's worst conflict. Mothers, nurses, doctors, code breakers, everyone. I'm putting a blanket over everyone here because there's just there's too many not to mention. But the point I'm getting across is that we could not have done it without the help of girl power. And here at Bumblebee, we remember that. And me, Chetty, your local Chris Farley or John Candy or something in between, whatever I am. Remember, I salute you ladies. Thank you for your service. Number 10, watching paint dry. Do you remember that thing that camp counselors used to do when the whole camp, if they were like acting crazy, they'd get you to sit down all together and like watch the paint dry. And if somebody like, little Timmy spoke out, then you'd have to restart. Anybody else do that? Just me? Okay, <laughs> fun. Anyways, so imagine my surprise to learn that something that was used as a mild punishment is the actual job of a man named Keith Jackson. Jackson lived in the UK and his job was literally to watch paint dry. He worked for a paint manufacturer and had to determine how well the paint was drying. So according to Jackson, it actually had some pretty high stakes. And I quote, watching paint dry sounds quite easy, but it can be stressful at times. Unquote. The more you know. Number nine, a crime scene cleaner. Of course someone has to do this. It is definitely a job I believe exists. Though I never really thought of it existing, I just thought they would just clean it up. But anyways, it definitely exists because we would know if someone had died in the house we were about to buy because it would still be a mess. But imagine the things you would see and how awful that would be. How do you even get a job like that? I do know that there are a lot of crime enthusiasts on this site, so I googled it. Turns out there is a job application so you can just apply. It is for a company called Aftermath Services in Vancouver and it's a $500 sign on bonus. Guess they're really looking for workers. Whatever brave souls are out there, we thank you for your service. Also, here's a perk. Considering the nature of this work, it definitely sounds like it's recession proof. Number eight, roadkill collector. 
Speaking of a crime scene cleaner, next up we have a roadkill collector. Yeah, this might be news for some of you who thought the squirrel you hit just like melted into the pavement after a few days of cars going over it. But no, this job actually exists and it's not mm, ideal. The task is sometimes grueling because often the poor little babies are, you know, well in the middle of the road. So they have to run out and scrape and scoop the critter out of there. All while like avoiding all the cars coming at them, otherwise trying to make them roadkill as well. On top of that, considering the conditions in which they perished, the stench and scenery is enough to churn even a sewer rat stomach, so. Number seven, a telemarketer. I know, we all know these exist, but like, I actually don't think anybody actually thinks about a telemarketer as an actual job. There are always the people that call you right as you're about to sit down for dinner being like, do you wanna buy this toy spork? And you're like, no, I don't wanna do that. I've seen people toy with them. I've seen people hang up the phone right away. Like, you know, if you pick up the phone and no one is there right away, like hang up. If someone says, hi, I'm calling on that, like you just hang up. They get told no in so many creative ways. It's almost like a special skill to be able to, <laughs> to be able to receive that much rejection consecutively. Wow, it's like being an actor. <laughs> but many people depend on this job as they're living and experience verbal abuse from many customers. Having to endure that kind of negativity all day, every day would be pretty hard to handle. So maybe we can be a little kinder. On top of that, they get paid most of the time on score-based systems, so they can't really take no for an answer until they've given it their best shot. So. Like, eh, just polite, be as polite as possible, but I get it, it's super annoying. Number six, snake researcher. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that of course we are going to bring up Mike Rowe, the dirty job man of the hour. I like snakes. I feel like there are two kinds of people, the people who are like afraid of snakes, but not spiders, and then the people who are afraid of spiders, but not snakes, you know what I mean? I'm the latter, so when I saw this job, I didn't think it would be awful at all, but it's nowhere near what you think. Mike Rowe says this is one of the grossest jobs he's ever done because, and I quote, to properly study the feeding habits of water snakes in Michigan, snake researchers pull large snakes from Lake Erie, squeeze them until they puke, then analyze their vomit to see what they've been eating. It's as disgusting as it sounds, but on the day in question, to add to the excitement, I was bitten no less than three dozen times. Annoying, bloody, and very dirty, unquote. Mike Rowe, oh, we salute you. Number five, an animal inseminator. We basically crack the semen off them, we freeze it, we chill it, and we send that semen globally. Rather than having to take the stallion to the mare, you can ship it around anywhere. Okay, so this exists. Though this guy seems to be absolutely like loving his job, which is great. People who do this for a living are essential for breeding purposes, though it is definitely not for everybody. Without going into too much detail, I'm going to try to describe this job as creatively as possible. In many ways, this job requires the employee to act as both lover and stork for certain animals such as cows and horses. The reason it exists is for the convenience of better breeding because they don't have to travel a breed or wait for them to mate. So instead, they position themselves to cat their mini selves and then they manually inject them into mares like cows for example and horses so not a very romantic process but then again whatever gets the job done I suppose but the grossest part like the grossest part even if you can't get your head around the other bit oftentimes the animal reacts to the injection of the baby juice by pooping really close to the inseminators face so like Definitely not for the faint of heart. Number four, shark soup tester. This list is basically partially in honor of every dirty job Micro has ever done. So he's gonna be featured again. Why putting a synthetic body within a chainmail suit wouldn't be a viable option for testing this? Apparently it isn't. There are not many jobs Mike Rowe found difficult to muster courage for, but this job remains in his top five jobs he wouldn't do again. According to Rowe, quote, the only way to see if a stainless steel shark suit works is to put one on and jump feet first into a full on feeding frenzy, to be bitten by a variety of hungry sharks and shook like a tug toy for 60 feet below the surface. I did this job for shark week against my better judgment, but live to tell the tale. Not dirty, but straight up terrifying. I won't be doing it again, ever. Unquote, like, 
Mike Rowe, if you ever watch the show Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe has gone through a lot. Like he went and checked out a bunch of different jobs and he doesn't have to even have to do each one for the rest of his life. He just tried a bunch of different ones. Great show, but if like that scared him, it sounds terrifying. That's not a job I would like to do. Number three, pet food taster. Ice cream taster, amazing. Chip flavor taster, yes please. Sommelier, sign me up. But did you know there was such a thing as a pet food taster? Good to know that at least the flavor profile is human approved for your pupper, but imagine tasting that for a living. Also, it is pet food, so it could be dog food, but it could also be like bird seed or bunny pellets. However, it does take a very highly skilled person to do it as it's a combination of research and taste. They have the job of evaluating a pet's nutritional value in their food and are tasked with finding ways they can improve that. But eventually they do have to sample it, put it on a little bib, yum. They evaluate the scent as it has to do with both human senses. After all, you don't want the house stinking like fish or dog food. And as well, and most importantly, for the pet. Thankfully, they do spit it out after reviewing the flavor, texture, and consistency. Unless it's really good. They probably just make that their lunch time. Number two, a chicken sexer. Uh, uh, what a title, you know? <laughs> what do you do for a living? I'm a chicken sexer. How do you bring that up to your in-laws? I'm not sure if my life is better knowing that the job of a chicken sexer actually exists, but for all the chicken that is consumed every day, it is really important. A chicken sexer's job is to distinguish the sex of a hatchling. Sounds okay so far, but it's how they do it that often gets really messy. The first version of this technique isn't so bad. Feather sexing is only done on broiler chickens that have a genetic mutation where female Male feathers grow faster, therefore they can kind of tell. But vent sexing is a little, you know, interesting. They have to hold a chicken a certain way and very gently squeeze the poop out so they can see the intestines. Then they can see the reproductive organs, which therefore determines the sex. This method was invented in the 1930s in Japan and though effective, not the prettiest job. But hey, 60K a year, not bad. Number one, last but not least, a sewer inspector. Number one, here we go. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, so if you want to skip ahead to liking and commenting portion of this video, then I won't blame you. But in the words of yet again, the one, the only, Mike Rowe, aside from sloshing through relentless chocolate tide, inspectors encounter a myriad of man-made products that shouldn't be flushed down the toilets along with roaches the size of thumbs and rats the size of bread loaves. It's hot, dirty, and too smelly to describe." Unquote. <sighs> God! No thank you, never gonna do that. I don't know if you could pay me enough if I'm being honest. But you can make anywhere from 52 to 72 grand a year for this dirty job. And as you can probably guess, it is essential. It is a privilege to be able to flush away our problem. So, so to all those watching who may work as sewer inspectors or in the sewer industry, we salute you.